Fitting I'm indifferent. I'm believing God. To the existence of God. is not judging them. I don't have proof. I don't know how to pray. They're judging themselves. You know, where is God in all of this? This is my home. God exists. What does it say about God that he created the orgasm? I don't pledge allegiance to anything. I don't pray. Only to God. If there was a God. And I thought. I just have this understanding that life is hard. He could never love me after this. God is still good. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Maybe God podcast YouTube channel. If you're new here, a special welcome to you. Be sure to uh, subscribe and like this video and ring the notification bell so you don't miss our weekly content that is aimed at hopeful skeptics and doubtful believers. I'm your host, Eric Huffman, and today I'm honored to welcome a writer that I've admired for years, decades, really, even <laughs> when I was barely holding on to any semblance of Christianity in my 20s and early 30s. Um, his work spoke to me and kept me tethered in a way to the faith. Uh, I've read over a dozen of his books personally, and two in particular are on the short list of books that I find myself picking up again and again on a regular basis, more than 20 years after reading them for the first time. Philip Yancey is one of America's leading Christian thinkers and writers, and most of his works are aimed at helping readers with their most difficult questions of faith. In his memoir, Where the Light Fell, he opens up about overcoming his strict Christian fundamentalist upbringing, and today we'll talk about that upbringing, how it informed his views on the evangelical church, and about a recent diagnosis that put his faith to the test. So welcome to the Maybe God podcast, Philip Yancey. Thank you, Eric, but you can't dangle that two books without telling me which ones they are. <laughs> well, I'll cut right to the chase, man. I was going to save it for later. And okay. I don't know, uh, I'm sure you have people, you know, coming and telling you which of your books are their favorites. And I think most people would say what's so amazing about Grace tops the list. Right. Um, I don't know sales numbers, how they stacked up, but my first foray into your work was, I, I don't have the book covers on these and so, <laughs> and they okay. are well worn, but this is my copy of the Jesus I never knew, which, um, was just for me, a seminal work about really getting to know who Jesus was in the flesh, who he is for us today in ways that I had never heard in my Bible belts upbringing and, and uh, even in seminary, I still go back today and find things that you wrote about Jesus in the 90s that uh, I hadn't heard anywhere else. But I don't know how many people have ever said this to you, but the book of yours that changed my life more than any other and continues to inform my faith and inspire me to be a better preacher and Christian is a book called Soul Survivor. And this is my oh, copy yeah. of Soul Survivor, which has been uh, <laughs> worn out pretty good. But um, I'm always amazed by um, sometimes Philip Yancey fans have, have never heard of or read Soul Survivor. And I'm like, you gotta, that's just like the best. If anything, if you love Philip Yancey's work, Soul Survivor will show you what Philip Yancey loves. And um, right. in, in terms of literature and, and the heroes you look up to, uh, it is uh, it is sort of an anthology of micro uh, biographies of uh, some of the people right. you look up to the most, and that's where I discovered G.K. Chesterton, who has been someone you know, among others, um, Dr. Paul Brand, um, you know, Annie Dillard, Shisaku Indu. I, I just I'm in awe of that book, and I'm really grateful for it. Well, that's my favorite book too, of the ones I've worked on is by it? far, and and the reason is I got to write about my heroes. You know, it's it's hard enough to write about yourself, but it was so relaxing to sit back and think, how am I different because of people and, and why? And I chose those people from different countries, from different centuries, actually, uh, who made me different because yeah. of uh, their work and because of what I learned about them. And some of them weren't even Christians. You know, Gandhi's in there. That's right. Uh, was never a Christian, but he knew more about Jesus than most Christians I know. Hmm. Interesting. And uh, you're, I mean, everybody knows about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but your yeah. chapter on him in that book, I mean, stunning. Yeah. I read things in that chapter that I had never heard. I mean, even as, a, you know, an American kid um, growing up, learning about the civil rights movement and things like that, I, I just, uh, I, I was blown away by your research and obviously your passion for him and the others that you wrote about in Soul Survivor. Yeah. And you talked about your struggles with faith. Uh, I learned early on, it's kind of the theme of my life, that not everybody who claims to speak for God does so. Mm. And that came came very close to home when my father got polio. I never knew him. I was just a year old when he died. Yeah. And he died because people believed he would be healed. 
and he was living in an iron lung, couldn't breathe on his own. And against all medical advice, a group of Christians believed that he would be healed. So they removed him from that iron lung and he showed a little bit of recovery for a few days. And then within a couple of weeks, he, he was dead. And that kind of set the tone of my family. My mother was unprepared. She had two young children, really no career training whatsoever. So I guarantee that we were living in poverty and we ended up living on the church grounds. We had a trailer home, it was eight feet wide, 48 feet long. And so the three of us lived in that little tin home <laughs> mm. on, the, on the grounds of the church and got completely saturated in the faith and couldn't, uh, couldn't get away from it. And one of the things that uh, we were taught in that church was just blatant racism. This was uh, back just as the civil rights movement was getting underway in the early 60s. And the church taught that black people were inferior, that they would never they'd make good servants, but that's all. And that became a huge crisis for faith when I found out it was wrong. Hmm. Because if the church had lied to me about race, maybe they lied to me about Jesus, about the Bible. And my my life ever since, as you know, Eric, since you've been reading some of it, is is an attempt to get back to go back and look at the things that I was taught and scrub them to find out what's worth keeping there and what are the crusty uh, mud piles that we've piled around the pearl of great price that Jesus left us. Because the church, uh, the church is not Jesus, and the church has misrepresented Jesus in in many ways and still does. That was the great humiliation. The risk, in a sense, that God took by turning over the message to us, and it's been a mixed message ever since. Huh. I mean, that uh, comes through in your writing, just how deeply you were shaped by your upbringing, not just in poverty with um, you know, a, a mother who was a widow trying to figure it out, um, and she herself was, I, mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, seems to have been pretty severe um, in terms of you know, discipline and what she expected of you. And then there was the the aspect of her, in a way, maybe doing the best she knew how, but turning you over to the religious, you know, the, the church at the time um, to help raise you. And I've heard you say that your least favorite um, Bible story is that of of, of Hannah and, uh, and Samuel. Can you say a little bit about why that is? Right, well, my mother was one of those who believed that her husband, would be healed. And they were planning to be missionaries in Africa. They had a whole crowd of people, several thousand who were supporting them, regular contributors promised to pray for them. And how crushing it was when instead of being able to realize their dream of being missionaries, serving God in Africa, instead all that was crushed by his death. My mother, I wrote a book called Disappointment with God, with God and in my mother's theology, you can't be disappointed with God. You can't be angry with God. But you have. she had these feelings of betrayal, I think, and they had to come out somewhere. And they came out in uh, probably a, a, a feeling of guilt because she, she believes that her husband would be healed and made that decision against all the doctor's advice. And, and he died, and she probably felt responsible at some point. The way she responded was by turning us over to God to replace our father literally, as missionaries in Africa. And this, the story is Hannah giving her son Samuel to God in the temple. She had been infertile. She finally had a baby, and she was so grateful to God. She said, this is, this is yours. You have answered my prayer, and I will turn him over to you. So as soon as he was a few years old, she took him to the temple, and, uh, and he became a, a priest. Spent the rest of his life doing that. It seems like a sweet story <laughs> to a lot of people. To me, it, it felt like a, a, a burden through most of my life and then kind of a curse because we were teenage boys. And, you know, teenage boys don't go around thinking, I'm going to be a missionary in Africa. They want to, you know, they want to listen to the latest music. They want to explore the world. And uh, it, it kind of triggered some very unhealthy reactions in her that uh, caused a rift in our family that hasn't been healed to the state. My brother and mother haven't, haven't seen each other in 52 years now. So, mm. so I've lived with that division that was really caused by uh, 
kind of a naive application of a, of a Bible story that, as you say, did become my least favorite because mm. it didn't work out that way in my life. Yeah, a lot of your early life seems to have been shaped by misapplication or misinterpretation of scriptures. And you've talked about how, how racist many in your early uh, years were, many adults were in your church sure. and things like that growing up. What were the biblical justifications for those arguments being made at the time? Well, some of your older listeners or viewers uh, may have heard of the curse of Ham theory. I, I hope not too many have, because it's an abominable, <laughs> yeah. destructive theory. And it's kind of strange how it came about. If you look at the chapter Genesis 9, there's something very strange going on. Uh, Noah has been with his family and a zoo full of <laughs> animals floating the world in an ark, and, and then it finally lands. And he celebrates, and he celebrates a little too much, gets drunk, and something happens, no details, fortunately, but something sexual happens there between Noah and his relatives. And he had he had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and then there were some grandsons as well. Well, one of the grandsons is, is named Canaan, and Canaan was involved in whatever happened. We don't know what happened, but Noah cursed Canaan and said that uh, you will be a servant to serve in the in the tents of your brothers the rest of your life. Well, people looked at Canaan's father, who is called Ham, and I understand that the Hebrew word for Ham is burnt black. Mm. So they said, ah, this is about slavery. Uh, God was ordaining slavery here. And uh, way back, you know, long before Jesus, uh, Arab slave traders and uh, Jewish People use that, and then in the 18th century, when the battles of slavery were going on, people applied that in, in this strange way to Ham, saying the, the African-American race had been cursed because they were burned black like Ham. Well, a couple of things. God didn't, didn't say the curse. It was, it was Noah, not God. And he didn't curse Ham, he cursed Canaan. Mm. But these things get twisted around. And I was taught that in my church in the 1960s, saying uh, African-Americans, and Atlanta had plenty of them, uh, that African-Americans were cursed by God and they were limited in how far they could go. They could make good servants, they could make good waiters. One of the visiting evangelists kind of comically demonstrated how Black people can hold a tray full of glasses and food and weave through a restaurant, but they could never be a lawyer or a doctor or a, a CEO or president of the United States. And and this was taught from the pulpit, from summer camps that I attended. And when you're a kid, you don't know what to believe. And the adults all say, this is true. So you kind of think it must be true. And I won a fellowship. I think it was the summer after my sophomore year in high school to the Center for Disease Control. It's called the Communicable Disease Center back then, which is based in Atlanta. And I, I knew that I would be reporting to this man who was, who was quite renowned in a specialized field, staining bacteria, Dr. Cherry. And I got some papers of his. I wanted to, you know, wanted to look good. So I studied these papers. I couldn't understand what in the world he was saying. It was way beyond me. He had gone to Yale, I think it was. And, um, Showed up for work the first day, anxious to meet Dr. Cherry, was escorted by the guard to his office, and the guard opened the door, and Dr. Cherry was a black man, was African-American. And that was a crack in my faith. It was one of those seminal moments when I realized I, I had been lied to, I had been betrayed, and I can no longer believe all the stuff that the church tells me. How old were you at that and time? I would have been about 14. Oh, wow. Yeah. And and so I went through a period, uh, pro well, about probably about five or six years of just putting my faith in suspension. I was still locked into the church system. We were, Because we lived on the church grounds, we had to go, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, uh, youth night, whatever it was, revivals in the summer, whatever was happening, we had to be there. Uh, so I couldn't escape the subculture, the kind of oppressive subculture, but I, I was guarded against it. I just didn't know what to believe. 
and uh, had been rattled, a feeling of betrayal. And, and that really set the course for, for my writing career, because that's what I've done. I've, I've taken the things I was taught and picked them up and looked at them and, and sorted through what was worth keeping and, and what, what was wrong. Right. That wrong. It's amazing that you came back full circle to Christianity at all, given the things you saw and heard growing up um, and the revelations you had as you became uh, an adult and a, a man in your own right. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but you and your brother grew up in that together. You've written mm -hmm. a lot about your brother, Marshall, and how right. that um, upbringing sort of sent you both on two different trajectories. Mm -hmm. Would you mind sharing a little bit about Marshall with our listeners? Sure. Marshall was two years older than I, and he's my big brother. He could beat me in anything. He was always more athletic, smarter, <laughs> certainly more musically talented. He had uh, incredible musical gifts uh, that he, he discovered. They were just kind of latent in him. He discovered one day, I tell the story about learning that he had absolute pitch, perfect pitch. <laughs> so if, if you, you know, he could identify if a train passes by or a fire engine or whatever, oh, that's E flat. No, that's F sharp. You know? Amazing. And he, he just has an inherent ability. And he also had almost perfect uh, musical memory. So he could hear something going on in the background if we were at a restaurant. Uh, even a concerto, and uh, without even concentrating, and then a week later, sit down and play it. I mean, it was just amazing. I, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I did not have that gift myself. I had to work very hard to to uh, play poorly. He didn't work that hard, and he played well. Uh, a variety of instruments. And uh, eventually, he decided to go to a conservatory uh, to develop his musical talents. And he decided a Wheaton College. And just to show you where, where our church was on the uh, liberal fundamentalist uh, spectrum, going to Wheaton was worse than going to Harvard because at <laughs> Harvard they they don't even believe in God. At Wheaton they claim to, but they're liberal. You know, people like My Billy goodness. Graham went there. <laughs> Billy and Graham, that, that noted Billy liberal. Graham, was, yeah, noted <laughs> liberal. He, he uh, has tea with Catholics. You know, he went to Russia, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, uh, when he went, when he went, I thought about the kind of curse. My mother saw this as breaking any hope that he would fulfill her dream for him to, to replace what they, she had lost in her husband. To be a missionary to Africa in specific? To be a missionary in Africa, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I tell that story in the book where first she tries everything. First she, she's going to get a a warrant from a federal judge for kidnapping for the person who was going to drive my brother to Wheaton. And he said, well, I'll fly Delta Airlines. What are they going to do, arrest Delta Airlines? You know? <laughs> and, and then she, she said these words that uh, have haunted both of us ever since. She said, I, I guarantee you that if you do this terrible act of rebellion, going to Wheaton College, <laughs> then I will pray every day for the rest of your life that you will be in a terrible accident and neither die or better yet be paralyzed so that you have to look at the look at the ceiling and realize what a terrible thing you've done. And it it was years later that I I put together that that was what my father was was like, paralyzed in that iron lung, just staring there looking at the ceiling morning, right. noon, and night, every day. And she would she would pray that for her son just because he he went to the wrong college. There's something wrong here. Mm -hmm. This is, this is not right. This, so that's why, when I mentioned earlier that the Hannah story doesn't ring so sweetly for me, it's it's because of how it soured and it really did become a curse. So my brother did go to Eden, uh, but this is the 1960s and he was searching freedom, and he. Uh, they can't make me graduate. So he didn't. He dropped out his final semester, never finished college, and um, started taking drugs. This is LSD time. He became one of Atlanta, one of Atlanta's early hippies. Uh. Would spend a lot of time in Piedmont Park, just kind of floating and, uh, you know, looking at clouds and grass and stuff. And uh, then eventually ended up in, in California. 
where there were a lot of hippies and went through a whole bunch of different addictions, substance addiction, sex addiction, a lot of things, a couple oh. of attempts at suicide, quite a, quite a journey, a journey to try to get away from everything he was taught. Yeah. We, we had a rule book. Yeah. He went to a Christian college and they, they had a rule book and his goal was to break every rule in the book. And I have a sense he's been, he's been doing that ever since just to try to break every rule in the book. Well, and it, it, it's not hard to understand how someone's <laughs> life can turn out that way. Um, yeah. given the upbringing and, and some of the things your mom told them and, and not having dad around. And, um, I don't know how else a life can turn out uh, other than uh, <laughs> when I look at you, it's kind of a miracle that um, you didn't end up in the same place doing the same things or worse than your brother. How do you sort of attribute, is, is it the fact that you took all that pain to your writing that sort of sets your life on a different track? Well, it, it is a miracle. And the the title of the book we're talking about, it, my memoir, is, is Where the Light Fell. And when I, I emerged from that church with a lot of things that needed correction, probably the worst mistake they made was giving me a misrepresentation of what God was like. I saw God as this angry uh, person who, who delighted in zapping people and roasting them in hell forever and was just waiting for you to make any tiny little mistake so he could crunch you. And uh, much like my mother prayed, you know, I, that, that was my image of God. That he was, oh, you're going to Wheaton College. I'll paralyze you the rest of your life. You know, yeah. it's this crazy stuff. But that's uh, that's how I was raised. And and so I had a different reaction than Marshall. I saw he was not making good choices. I could tell that. You know, he should have been a concert pianist. He ended up tuning pianos because mm. he dropped out and and uh, didn't have the discipline to do to do what he needed to do. So I didn't want to go his route, for sure. And and instead, I tell the story of kind of erecting a, a bulletproof shield around myself so they, they can't get to me, you know? The church can't get to me. My mother can't get to me. God can't get to me. Um, and that, I was very serious about that. And I look back on it, you know, I think if, if I were doing that today, I'd probably be one of these cutters, one of these self har self harbors. Well, you um, broke your own arm once. I did that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Why? But we didn't know about cutting or some <laughs> other things. And, and so I was, I thought I was imperial. I thought God, not even God can get to me. And God did not crush me. God did not, uh, break me as I thought and was trying to resist. God melted me, seduced me, I, I guess I would say. Where the Life Fell comes from a quote by St. Augustine, who said, I couldn't look at the sun directly, but I could look at where the sun's rays fell, where the light fell. And that was my story. I couldn't look at that sun, that God directly, because that God would had scorched me. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what he did. He scorched people. But gradually, uh, through three things, and I spelled them out, that nature, the beauties of nature, and classical music, in my case, we even in this little trailer, we were raised with an appreciation for great music, and then romantic love. Each of those, each of those softened and melted me, because I, I was trying to prove there's no such thing as good or bad. There's no such thing as good music or bad music. There's no such thing as beauty and ugliness. You know, I'd go... I worked on a garbage truck to prove there's no such thing as a bad smell. You know? <laughs> and you, you do get used to smells pretty quickly. But uh, that was just my kind of tormented adolescence way of coping with bad circumstances. Mm. And, and so when I melted through those three things, especially the romantic love part, uh, because I fell in love and I... It, it is a fall, and uh, it was real, and it was something that happened to me. It was not something I manipulated. Or, in, in fact, all three of those things kept edging in and and just kind of softening me, getting me ready. But the God part was the last part, and uh, that was a miracle. I, I, was this, I was at a Christian college, but I was a campus renegade, so I took delight in sitting in the 
in the open area reading books like Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian and, and books like that. I was a jerk, you know? Yeah. Uh, and they didn't really know how to, how to handle apostates at Christian <laughs> colleges in general. So I was, I was alone, uh, proudly alone. And, and God granted me a, a, a vision. And I just, I don't know what else you would call it. I was in a prayer meeting. I started praying and, and I had a vision and, and spoke aloud. And it, it really felt like a, a direct supernatural intervention. I've had, uh, you know, I, I've only had one, <laughs> uh-huh. but it was so powerful and so unexpected and unsought. I, I didn't want to be at that prayer meeting. I had never prayed once in that prayer meeting. And, and yet it happened. And uh, when what something like see? that happens, yeah, well, we had this thing called Christian service and I had done some different ways. Uh, I was on this thing called chain gang for a while where we would go to prisons and they were actually chained together with the ball and chain. This is wow. in South Carolina. Most, I think all of the prisoners were African Americans where we went and we would play the accordion and, and teach them the Bible, you know, we were going through the 10 commandments. I'm thinking these guys broke a lot more than 10 uh-huh. commandments. See if they could teach us. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, got tired of that. So I signed up for university work. We we're supposed to go and, and witness on a university campus. And I found they had a, they had a student center with a TV. My goodness, we didn't have any TVs on our Christian college campus. Mm. So I would just mostly sit there and, and watch TV and then come back and say, yeah, yeah. Didn't have too many, uh, too many opportunities tonight, but uh, one conversation, you know. And so we had to have a prayer meeting each week to support this ministry. And the other guys would all pray. They were very devout, Craig, Joe, Chris. And they would pause a few seconds politely. And of course, I never prayed. I'm Philip, you know, I don't pray. I don't believe in God. And, and then uh, they had been praying about these 10,000 people at the university campus and how can we, how can we witness, how, how can we teach them the good news of the gospel? And I started praying. I just said, God, and the room got very tense very quickly because I'd never spoken before. And I said, uh, as you know, I don't care about those 10,000 people at the university. I don't care if they go to hell. I don't even care if I go to hell. And it was really tense at that point. I mean, yeah. <laughs> if you've been in these kind of meetings. <laughs> and then uh, as I was praying, I started talking about the Good Samaritan. I, I know we're supposed to be like the Good Samaritan with these people, uh, these bloody characters in the ditch here. We're supposed to care about them. I don't. I don't. And, and I actually had a vision and... Uh, first, there was this bloody character in the ditch, and as I looked closer, it was me. I was the needy one. And when I looked at the Good Samaritan, and again, it was, you know, in the biblical robes, so kind of, this would be the mill look. <laughs> and, and the Good Samaritan was reaching down, and I realized it was the face of Jesus. And every time Jesus reached down, I would spit in his face spit in his face. And it was a revelation. I realized I, I thought I was as sophisticated, uh, smarter than the other people around me, not one of these happy face Christians, you know, these naive people. And, and I saw myself as the neediest one of all, uh-huh. you know, I had this armor and, and suddenly I didn't have the armor. It was all gone. And your wounds were exposed. The wounds were exposed, and I didn't know. I, I got up and left. I walked out of the room and wrote a note to Janet. My girlfriend became my wife later and, and said, I may have had the first authentic religious experience of my life. I don't know. It may, it may pass tomorrow. But it didn't pass, and it changed everything from that moment on. And it was so embarrassing. I mean, I, I stood up later that week in a class and told the story and said, please don't, don't ever talk to me about this, but I need to, I need to say it happened. It was embarrassing. And, uh, why? I mean, I think I understand why, but why was it embarrassing <laughs> and hard for you to fess up to this vision you had? 
Well, I had so carefully cultivated this image of uh, the skeptic, you know, who wasn't like all these other people, and and I'm doing fine on my own, thank you. I don't need all this Jesus help. Uh, as C.S. Lewis and so many have said, uh, pride is the greatest sin, and that's what keeps people from the kingdom. It's it's an act of surrender. It's it's an act of of giving in. I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. I I can't help myself. I I need help. Kind of like the twelve step people uh, reaching bottom. I I can't do it. I need a higher power. I need something from outside. And and that was something from outside for me because I certainly didn't go into that room thinking, oh, I'd like to have an experience with God. <laughs> exactly the opposite. Trying yeah. to get away from that. Um and. And it happened. So it was a miracle. And I thank God for it. Yeah. After you're seven, 72, 73 now? Um, 73. Mm -hmm. 73. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> that's the one vision you've had your whole life? Yeah. The one, the one where I actually saw faces and images like that. I've had, I've had experiences of intimacy with God. Of course. Uh, not that common, you know. It's I've had a few rare times of of true intimacy. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it, you know, I think at least the the group I grew up in, we we really wanted God to be directly involved in our lives every day, every minute, You're telling us what to do, what to think, and and. It's as if we want, you know, we want God to solve our problems for us. And and I see that differently now. God is spirit. God did become a human being in the incarnation in Jesus. And God experienced what it was like. Hebrews said it was a learning experience for him. But he went back, and I, I think God feels under no obligation or desire to keep micromanaging planet Earth or my life. God is spirit, and so that's why I need to work on spiritual disciplines so that I can enter God's realm. And and those are different, you know. They take silence and meditation and and uh, prayer and and those kind of things. That that's so different than than wanting God to change everything in my life. You well, know, I don't think I brought three of your books with me today, and they all <laughs> look the same because I don't use book covers. But the third one is your prayer book. And mm -hmm. I remember distinctly having my world uh, in terms of prayer turned upside down by your your whole premise in the beginning of this book, which is, look, prayer isn't about getting God to fulfill our wish list. It's about ascending the heights, uh, the mountaintops uh, spiritually and um, attempting to see God, to see the world and ourselves from God's point of view. Um, it's a perspective shift. Mm -hmm. And that was, for me, a game you changer know. in terms of prayer and Oh, I think that's what great. I hear you talking about with your the spiritual disciplines and um, you know seeking God in in that way rather than just saying "Give me, give me, give me." Right. Yeah, that was that was a huge shift for me too. Uh, I, uh, little secret, Eric. Uh, people like people like me. We we don't write books about things we know. We write about we write books about things we don't know but want to know. <laughs> that's right. And uh, you know, I, I'm the last person to write an advice book on prayer. But that's a good reason to write a book on prayer because I can go to people who can really help me. I can go to sources and yeah. and, and learn about it. And I'm, I'm a journalist, so I take complicated things to try to make them simple just so I can understand them. And the, th the two things I learned about prayer were that uh, prayer is inviting God into my life. And, and that I think that's what praying without ceasing is is hinting toward. It's a way of viewing these people around me, the phone calls that I'm going to make, even what we're doing right now, viewing it through God's eyes. How how would God like me to respond to this person in front of me in the checkout line, line or the person on the end of the helpline when my computer wasn't working the other day? And that's a tough one. You know, <laughs> how, how do I treat them with with respect and compassion and care when I've I've been on a phone tree for 40 minutes you know, and I've gotten nowhere. So inviting God into my life, but more important, inviting myself into God's life. Yeah. Um, I mentioned a, the pastor I had in Chicago for years, and he said, 
He said, my first prayer each day was, God, tell me what's going, what you're doing in Chicago today and how I can be a part of it. And that's a different prayer than how you can fix my problems. You know? Right. It's, you know, we're, we're here to do the work of God. Sure. And, and, uh, part of prayer is finding out what that is, what, what God is doing around us right now and how we could be a part of it. Well, and even, I mean, going back to your vision, the prequel to getting there with prayer, uh, where you're seeking God's will and, and what he wants us to do in the world is seeing ourselves in the ditch first, because mm. we can so easily read the story of the good Samaritan and see ourselves as the good Samaritan and see bad religious people as those guys that crossed the street and walked past. And maybe the whole point of Jesus's story is for us to see that we were in the ditch first and you can't really be the good Samaritan until you've seen yourself in the ditch. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. And, um, Luke is the one who tells the story of the Good Samaritan, and, and he loves these juxtapositions. Like uh, what, another one along that line is is the Pharisee and the tax collector yeah. praying in the temple, and the Pharisee says, "Oh, I'm so glad that I'm better than better than 99 percent of the people in the world, and certainly better than that tax collector over there." And the tax collector just says, "God have mercy on me. I'm a sinner." And it's pretty clear who the hero is. And that's all the way through. I mean, Jesus does that twist because it's so easy for us to start being one of those Pharisees. And, and nothing made Jesus more angry in his days on earth than the Pharisees, who were, they were good people. They were law-abiding, conscientious, Bible-believing people. But they, they fell with that whole pride thing again. I'm better than those guys. I'm holier than thou. And the whole point of Jesus is you're not, you're not holier than thou. <laughs> you're, you're not even close, you know. Don't compare yourself to the people around you. Compare, be perfect. Yeah. I can't be perfect. Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's my message. You, and that's what grace is all about. There and is. you don't experience grace unless you come to a place where you realize, thankfully, it's not based on my performance here because I we'd all get Fs. Yeah. None of us would pass the class. There's a couple of themes that I see throughout, you know, the books I've read of yours and and your other works, um, which uh, the first one we've talked about pain and your own woundedness obviously gave rise to so much of your writing on pain. But I think connected sure. to that is just theme of grace. Um, yeah, I'm assuming you're the best selling book of the ones you've written is what's so amazing about grace. Is that accurate? It is. And you just fell into a nice trap here, Eric, Did because I? Uh, it's the 25th anniversary this year. Hey of that book. And so I've been going through and uh, updating it because in 25 years, a lot has changed. For instance, it talks about the war in Yugoslavia. Well, uh, Generation Z was it? Well, uh, what's that? Right, you know? right. <laughs> and we, we, we got some young people to go through and, and mark stuff that they couldn't identify <laughs> with. And they'd say things like, who is Al Gore, you know? And, you know? <laughs> and, and so uh, I've just spent several months going back and and doing an update mainly by plugging in more modern contemporary sure. references. It's probably sad so, how easy that was to do because the world's and That's the cyclical. sad part, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, let's see. Let's take Yugoslavia out. We could talk about Ethiopia. We could talk about Ukraine. Right. Okay, I'll talk about Ukraine. You know, you have so many options because it, the divisions in the United States now compared to 25 years ago, we thought it was bad then. It, it wasn't even close. Yeah. And, uh, we need grace more than ever. Yeah. What is the connection between seeing yourself wounded in a ditch and grace? What is, what is that connection yeah. for you? Obviously, um, both of these themes came crashing together in that vision that you had. Yeah. I think Henry Nellen is the first one I remember coming up with this image, but he said, he said, grace is, is a free gift. Can't do anything to earn it, deserve it. You don't, we don't. That's the point. It's grace. You know? But to receive a gift, you have to have your hands open. And if you don't, the gift will just fall to the ground. You, you won't receive it. And I've seen that in so many places. I, I remember one time I was asked to speak to a group of prostitutes, over a hundred of them from different countries, even. There was a convention going on in, in uh, Green Lake, Wisconsin. And I flew up there, they, they called me and said, uh, these 
these women have all they've all been converted. We're we're building a you know a safe place for them. We're teaching them careers, and uh, they have a hard time experiencing grace. Can you come talk to them about grace? And I said, well, yeah, but only if I if they can talk to me too. Could I have a session where I just hear their stories? And so one afternoon for several hours, uh, it was one of these tiered classrooms, and there were 100 prostitutes and me, <laughs> the only man in the room. And, and I just said, can you tell me your stories? And they told me these uh, just amazing stories of, of abuse and addiction. And uh, I mean, it's not like what you see on TV, these glamorous women in high heels. Uh, some of the developing countries, like in Latin America, they would turn, it, it's almost unbelievable, but a hundred tricks a night, a hundred tricks a night. So just, and, and uh, violence, they had scars and, and, and I heard story after story. And then I said, well, did you know that, that Jesus talked about prostitutes? No, <laughs> they didn't. I said, yeah, he said, Prostitutes and tax collectors will go into the kingdom of God ahead of the scribes and Pharisees, the religious professionals. Well, what do you mean by that? And we talked a little bit, and I talked about some of Jesus' parables. And I said, "Can what do you hear? Can you make sense of that? And this woman, I think she's from Bulgaria. We had already heard her story, just a, an incredible story, spoke up, and she said, um, I had a strong accent. She said, you know, all of us, all of us, nobody said to daughter, I want you be good prostitute when you grow up. We, we at the low, mm -hmm. we kick out of homes. We are at the low. And sometimes when you are at the low, you cry for help. And I said, that's grace. That's grace. That's the the wounded person in the ditch. Amen. You know, and and that's that first step in the twelve steps. I can't do it on my own. I can't heal myself. I need help. Right. And and that's the connection for me. It's uh, the danger of the Pharisee is always I'm do, I'm doing fine. I'm better than all those people. Ah. And, uh, and 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 grace falls to the ground. Yeah. And received, but it, when you're at the low and you got nowhere else to turn, then sometimes you cry out for help. Mm. Yeah, Amen. And and uh, you're spot on with the the articulation of the dangers of Phariseeism, and and we see it even now, maybe even especially now these days with um, just I don't know. I call myself an evangelical. I know you do too, but the evangelical church just continues to wrestle with Phariseeism and different in different forms. And, um, what, what are you, what are you seeing now in terms of evangelicalism and in, in the West, uh, mm -hmm. in particular in, in terms of, of how we're doing church and communicating the gospel? Yeah. The, the new twist that is obvious to everybody is how political the evangelicals have become. Uh, when I was young, I mean, we went to a fundamentalist church. It was to the right of evangelicals. But we we didn't talk about politics in church. Uh, we talked about sin and behavior and you know hippies. things like that. Yeah, hippies, <laughs> hair length and jewelry and stuff, smoking and, and drinking and stuff like that. Uh, we wanted to be different than the world. We wanted to be uh, separate, come out from among them and be separate. The quote would yeah. would hear a lot. And we were separate. We were different. And, this, and that's not all bad. You know, I look back, I don't have resentment. Uh, it saved us from a lot of pain growing up because, uh, you know, our version of, of being, being marginal would be go roller skating where people look like they're dancing. <laughs> well, that's safer than going to a bar all night, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> and, um, but we didn't really talk about politics. And it was only in the, started in the, I guess the 1970s, Jimmy Carter was elected. He was the year of the evangelical cover of Newsweek. And then, uh, with Francis Schaefer and Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, 
much more of a James Dobson, much more of a, an emphasis on political issues. They were important issues. Right. Abortion, homosexuality. And, and then it became almost, uh, those were the, that was the calling card. You know, that's, that's, that was our, our core belief. Well, actually it's the, it's not our core belief because Jesus didn't talk about either one. You know, Jesus didn't talk about abortion or homosexuality. Very important issues and may be mentioned elsewhere in the scripture, but Jesus didn't talk about them. So it, it, there's got to be something else that, that, that we should be communicating. And, and now, you know, the problem with politics is it's an adversary sport. Yeah. So uh, you don't treat the, your opponents with respect and dignity and, and love. You try to beat them down. You try to catch them and put them in jail, you know? Right. That's the way politics works. And uh, it's really tricky. The church the church hasn't done very well. You, you talked about the church in, in the West. And yeah, you've probably been to Europe. And, there, you know, the Christianity reigned there for a thousand years. Yeah. Every village, the biggest church, biggest building is a cathedral church. But you go in them, and there'll be like four gray-haired people on right. a Sunday morning. What happened? Well, it's not so much that they decided this isn't true anymore. It's what happened in so many places was the church became part of the state, became part of the government. And uh, you know, Spain would be a great example. The Catholic Church was allied with uh, Francisco Franco, and then he was seen as an oppressive dictator. They overthrew him. So they stopped going to church. You know, he was, they were allies. And that's the danger facing the evangelical church in America because we're, New York sees us as a voting block. We're not. We understand that. But they don't, you know, they just, that politics is their world. And uh, they, they color us by red and blue, you know, by, by politics. And and once you do ally, once you do make your goal to be close to the centers of power, it's really hard to be the conscience. Martin Luther King used to say, the church is not the master of the state. You know, we, we don't dominate it. It's not the servant of the state. It's the conscience of the state. And there are some things I'm going to agree with the Republican Party. There are some things I'm going to agree with on the Democratic Party. And I'm going to make my, my choices not by whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat, but what would Jesus have me to do on, on this issue? And there's not a lot of room for politi for that in politics. You know, it's, it's a black and white, you're on my side or, or the other side. Right. And Jesus said, well, what do you do with the other side? You love your enemies. You know? <laughs> Nobody's doing that much in politics. So we, we have a lot to learn and a lot to, to show the world. Yeah, I, I ache for a, a rise of a countercultural anti-establishment uh, evangelicalism where we wake up to the reality that we've been played by various powers that be um, whether they yeah. be political parties or or mainstream media outlets or what have you and uh, just be um, absolutely enamored with Jesus and outrageously um, impassioned to share the gospel and not get uh, you know dragged into these sort of cultural um, uh, mudslinging uh, controversies um why do you yeah. in light in light of your upbringing especially but even in light of modern evangelicalism why do you still call yourself an evangelical in your writing well the word means good news and i was with the head of the national association of evangelicals not long ago a man named walter kim he's of uh, korean descent american and was a pastor at park street church in uh in Boston, classic, great old evangelical church. And he had just gotten back from, I think it was called the World Evangelical Congress or something like that, WEC. Each, each uh, country had, had one official representative. So the United States had one, Germany had one, Korea had one, you know. And he said, they kind of ganged up on him and said, we understand that evangelicals have become it, that's become a bad word in your country, the United States, that almost like fundamentalists used to be. Uh, 
or all, all we hear is evangelicals vote for Donald Trump, you know? So, but he's, they said, you can give up that word if you want to, but in our countries, when you say the word evangelical, what people who don't know anything about religion, what comes to their mind is the hospitals, the clinics, the schools, the people who help out in case of a, a, of a hurricane or a typhoon or an earthquake, uh, the people who are trying to free people caught up in sexual trafficking. Wherever missionaries have gone, they tend to be evangelicals, and I've used that, that word over the years, and, and that's the heritage they leave. And you can't take that word away. The word means good news. And in our country, evangelicals mean good news. Uh, and in most countries, the Christians are still a minority, but that, that's what they think of. So, uh, you know, in the United States, we want to, anytime something becomes a problem, we want to change the terminology and change the word, you know. So, so uh, you know, handicap becomes disabled, becomes differently abled, you know, how that goes. Right. And uh, I don't think, at some point, maybe we will have to just stop using the word because to most people in the United States, it, it does have a political connotation. But uh, I, I don't think we should do it without a fight mm. <laughs> and without reminding people, uh, you know, it's not the terminology, it's the fruit. Uh, and, and we can be proud of the heritage of every city. You go to any prison and the evangelicals are going to that prison and conducting Bible studies and helping out and helping people after they get out of prison to find jobs, foster parents. In so many areas, evangelicals in, in the in churches without any spotlight on them, they're just going about doing the work of the kingdom because uh, they believe Jesus wants us to do that. Yeah. So let's not let go of that uh, easily. I love the answer. I mean, um, the idea of of holding on to that that title in uh, of evangelicalism in, in solidarity with evangelicals the world over is very compelling to me. It's not the easiest case to make to people in our culture, right. especially when you're trying yeah. to, um, you know, influence people and, and encourage them to come into the fold. <laughs> they often would uh, be okay coming to Jesus, but I'm not going to become an evangelical because of, you know, X, Y, Z reasons. Um, right. Kind of putting that aside in a way, what would your advice then be to a 20 and 30 something year old Christians that are on fire for Jesus and want to be influential in the lives of those around them, but, you know, don't want to make the same mistakes of uh, negative uh, kinds of evangelicalism that we've seen? We we're re recording this not that long after Easter. And one thing I do uh, Passion Week most years is carefully go through the what's called the Upper Room Discourse, John 13 to 17. Uh, unlike anything in the Gospels, you know, most, most of the Gospels give little quick summaries of what Jesus did, or then they'll flesh out his parables a bit, but not a lot of personal detail and uh, and there, John slows down and just kind of walks through uh, an evening, 30, 40, so five different chapters uh, on this one evening where Jesus is talking. And it, what did he tell us to do? He told us, you're, you're to serve. You wash their feet. You right. know, you're the servant, not the master. And then he talked about, Church unity. In fact, he prayed this extraordinary prayer. He said, I'm thinking back to before the world began. <laughs> Jesus had a long memory. <laughs> and he said, uh, Father, could they, these, these that I'm leaving this mission to, can they have the same unity that we have in the Trinity? Whoa, what a prayer. And then, um, and, and, and then that, what should the world see? We're known the mark of a Christian is love. It's a new command I give to you. So, I mean, it sounds simplistic, but that was Jesus' last word. Those those three things, serve, love, and unity. And if we met 
Uh, you know, if we spend as much time meeting on how can we demonstrate those things as we have spent over the years in coming up with the best theology of the atonement or, you know, all the different doctrinal things, or uh, as I often say, if John says that Jesus came full of grace and truth, if we spend as much time trying to be grace-filled people as we as we try to get the truth right, you know, that that's the balance that that uh, the church doesn't always get right. Right. And, and so, um, what I find is it, really you understand the gospel and, and you keep, uh, you keep good accounts. If you do have an act of service, going to prisons or going to a home for the mentally challenged or those with uh, memory care facilities with those with dementia. That's where, that's where the rubber meets the road mm -hmm. of the gospel. Yeah. And Jesus was so clear toward the end of his life in that passage in Matthew 25, where he says, uh, if, if you clothe the naked, if you feed the hungry, if you visit the prisoners, you've done it to me. And, and that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be pleasing Jesus. Right. And, he was, he was pretty clear about that. So you've, uh, you've talked about uh, ministering to others in, in some of the memory care facilities and things like that. Uh, I know that in uh, recent months, uh, I guess it was fall of last year, you um, faced maybe the, the worst news you've gotten from, uh, <laughs> from a doctor other than the time you broke your neck in the car accident. Um, this no. was pretty serious, and it was upon being announced to the world. It was very shocking to, to people that know you and have followed you. But, but uh, talk to us about how your life changed last fall and um, what that pretends for your uh, future. Right. I live in Colorado. It's, it's an outdoor state. And that's why we moved here. We were in downtown Chicago and just decided to get out of a city and go somewhere with some trees and animals and mountains. And, and so we didn't really know people here, but we just packed up and moved because I'm a freelancer. I can write pretty much anywhere. And we have used the state. You know, I, it, in the summer, I mountain bike and we climb the mountains, the 14ers, 14,000 foot mountains here. Spent many, many summer days doing that. In the winter, I ski, cross-country ski, uh, snowshoe, you know, do all the winter sports. And um, it's a huge part of my life. And actually, I didn't, I didn't get a diagnosis until, until January of 2023. So I, I, I found strange symptoms. I, I would be skiing and give an order to turn, and my legs didn't follow that order. So, well, I always appeared. And a little bit of a balance issue, uh, strange symptoms. And I went to my doctor and described some of them, and he said, Ah, uh, oh, you're in great shape, Philip. Uh, you can't have Parkinson's disease, because that's what I was asking him about. But the symptoms continued, and I started kind of slowing down and just feeling a little more uncoordinated. And finally, I went to some specialists, and uh, they said, yeah, without that, you've got Parkinson's disease. And uh, I haven't known that many people with Parkinson's disease, but the people who I do know personally had a pretty bad case. And I found out that uh, not everybody does. In fact, there's a saying that if you know, what, if you know one person with Parkinson's disease— then you know one person with Parkinson's disease, <laughs> which means uh, everybody's different. Right. And uh, I have met people who have been, you know, all on stuff, almost locked in and frozen and, and uh, can hardly move. He, people may have seen the movie uh, with Robin Williams' Awakenings yes. back when there was no real treatment for Parkinson's disease. Well, there is now. There's some good medication but you, you just don't know. And, and so it was like a sword hanging over my head that will probably be hanging over my head the rest of my life hmm. because uh, it, it's, we don't know that much about it. We can control certain symptoms, but you can't really treat the disease itself. You can just kind of cloak it 
And some people can live a long time. Matthew J. Fox would be an example. He said Parkinson's for almost 30 years, I think. It's pretty obvious in him. And of course, he's had the best treatment you can get. But again, I've, I've been to funerals of people um, who are in pretty bad shape toward the end of their lives. Yeah. So uh, I, I realized, okay, I got I to gotta start letting go things that I love. Don't know mountain biking. I don't know road biking. Okay, safer on some roads, <laughs> depending on the traffic. Um, skiing. I think skiing's okay because uh, I don't know, you're sliding. You know, you're letting the mountain do the work, and the coordination isn't that as important as in walking, for example. And uh, it's kind of a preview of old age because we we all face those things. My mother is. Tur next month turns 99. You know? Wow. <laughs> so I could have another 25 years in front of me. Um, and if it, if I do have another 25 years, I'll be letting go of a lot of things that I do now that I, will, I won't be doing when I'm 99. So it just kind of speeds up that aging process. And it, it makes me, it makes me uh, a lot more aware of disabilities around me. And I, I accepted an engagement this summer. There's a camp run by Easter Seals for polio survivors. Mm -hmm. So those are people my age who had polio when they were kids. And then, you know, suddenly there was a vaccine and people didn't get polio anymore. And they have these post-polio symptoms, this post-polio syndrome, it's called, that expresses itself in different ways. So I'm going to be speaking to them. And I, I've just started noticing, you know, I flew back from a trip on an airplane, and there was a, there was a man who was quite elderly and possibly had Parkinson's, not coordinated, and he, he was so slow and getting his suitcase out of the overhead bin, and he would sit in the wrong seat and go use the wrong bathroom up in first class, you know, do all this all this wrong stuff. And it's easy to make snap judgments about people like that. And I realized that could be me. <laughs> that could be me. And prayed for what I call grace-healed eyes. Mm. Uh, eyes to see others as God sees them. Yeah. You know, not not as our highly competitive society sees them. And and the United States, compared to a lot of uh, countries, is we've got all these laws that that uh, that protect the disabled in terms of curbs and, and parking places and things like that. But uh, it, it's easy it, it, it's easy just to kind of look at them as invisible people and not realize it just that person <laughs> that person was healthy at one time yeah and and that person is still in there, you know and I dare not label them. I, I titled the article dislabeled I, I dare not label them and, and and see that label rather than see the person inside. In the same way, I, I now don't want people to treat me that way. I don't want them to think of me as Parkinson's first and then Philip second, but Philip, who has this thing that at this point I'm coping pretty well with. Um, so I've got a lot to learn. Yeah. And as you say, I've written a lot about pain. My very first book was a book called Where Is God When It Hurts? And uh, I've been around a lot of people who, who have been suffering and sometimes the church does well, sometimes not so well. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I think we, you know, I, I'm sure my writing will reflect things that I learn along the way. Well, a couple of things come to mind as you share that, and thank you, by the way. The first is your work um, and Dr. Brand's work around pain and how pain is uh, it's a signal and it can be um, helpful in terms of um, letting us know something's wrong and and getting us to toward right. healing. Um, and if anybody hasn't looked at Dr. Brand's work with leprosy and and Philip's uh, coverage of that in in Soul Survivors, where I read it first, by the way, another Oy. tip of the hat to Soul Survivor. Um, I mean, that's that's one thing. The other thing is just again, just that vision of you being ministered to in the ditch by Jesus. It's, uh, it's almost a recurring vision throughout life that we all sure. should, um, be able to see is that we're not just these, uh, well-adjusted, 
you know, saved people that get to minister to others. First, we were in the ditch and we find ourselves in all kinds of ditches uh, throughout our lives. And we receive from Jesus. You talked about love being one of the three, you know, points in Jesus's three point sermon in the gospel of John. But I mean, the, the whole, the whole thing about love in the new Testament is love as you have been loved by God, right? Love yeah. because God first loved you and you in the ditch is God loving you. And, and you tapping away your keyboard and speaking to prostitutes and um, helping, you know, lost, stubborn young men like me stay tethered to Jesus is your way of sharing the love that God showed you in the ditch. And I pray that that just continues in this next season of your life, whatever that looks like as you receive that ministry from God, that love from Jesus, that you continue to be a vessel and a conduit to others to experience that. Yeah, I... I had an experience where I was speaking on prayer and, uh, I, I talked about love your enemies and I said, I, I pray for those who persecute you. And I said, when I read, when I read this, I realized I have never done that. I've never prayed for Russia in the cold war days. Uh, whoever our enemies were, I never, I never prayed for them. And, um, Why would Jesus ask us to do something so counterintuitive, so crazy by world standards? And I'm sure the disciples who first heard that, you know, they're occupied by Roman troops. They were oppressive. I'm sure when Jesus said, yeah, if a Roman asks you to soldier, ask you to carry a pack for a mile, volunteer to do it for two miles. <laughs> That's crazy talk. That's crazy talk. You don't help the enemies. You find a way to get rid of them. Why would Jesus do that? Why would he suggest such a crazy thing? And it was pretty clear because the disciples asked him something similar. And he said, well, it's because that's the only way that people will know what the Father is like. God causes the sun to shine, the rain to fall on the good people and the bad people alike, on the friends and the enemies alike. And the only way the world is going to see something like that is if you demonstrate it if you show them what God is like. Mm. And uh, that's that's our job, uh, to, sh to be the visible proof of what God is like. Amen. That's, that's a hard time job. <laughs> <laughs> and none of us do it perfectly. Jesus did. Yeah. And that's why he spent so much time um, among the, the marginalized, among the needy. Yeah. Uh, well, along those lines of what you just shared, um, I'll share my one of my favorite quotes from the Jesus I Never Knew, and then I'm, I'm going to ask you a final question. But this quote is so perfect for what you were just sharing. Uh, you wrote, from beginning to end, the conflict between Rome and Jesus appeared to be entirely one-sided. The execution of Jesus would put an apparent end to any threat, or so it was assumed at the time. Tyranny would win again. It occurred to no one that his stubborn followers just might outlast the Roman Empire. It's one of your many... <laughs> classic and great lines and they outlasted the Romans not with you know force for force it was with love it's such a powerful yeah. reminder so yeah. uh, Philip you've written over uh, two dozen books um, you've been the keynote speaker at events all over the world you've scaled some of the world's uh, tallest mountains <laughs> you've interviewed multiple American presidents you're married to the lovely Janet who we did not give enough time to today in our conversation but maybe we'll save that for another time. I know what an impact she's had on you. And you've been together with her since college, but what do you today consider to be your life's crowning achievement so far? I don't know if this really answers your question, but after the diagnosis with Parkinson's, I couldn't help having questions about mortality, you know, how long will I live? And some people immediately thought, oh, I'm going to be debilitated right away. And that's not true. I could, I could last for 20 years and, and have a few symptoms. But, um, what strikes me, I start, I started getting responses from a bunch of people all over the world saying you were here in South Africa in 1992, or you were here in the Philippines in 2003. And I realized that um, my books are still there, will still be there. They, I poured myself into them. It's kind of a strange 
occupation. I, I was leeching off of other people. So I would go out and find these people who were, who were doing the work of the gospel and then just come back and tell their stories. And, and many times I would feel, I would feel everything is so vicarious. You know, I, I need to be in the prisons doing it myself, but if, if I did all these things and I, I never get around to writing and, and what I really need to do is, is write and shine the light on people who are doing what Jesus wants us to do. And, and, and so it was a confirmation of, of the choice I made early on. I think I, I became a writer because I didn't trust, I trusted words on page because I could look at them and think about them and decide whether I believed them or not. I, I had been raised in churches where they scream at you and make you go forward with these emotional manipulations and, and, and all that. And I, I didn't trust people in person, but I trusted words. And then I was able to make a career because I, I wrote my books for myself with things I was struggling with, trying to find out what is so amazing about grace. Does prayer make any different? I didn't know the answers to those questions, so I would write a book about them. And one time I wrote about it like I, I'm in a jungle area in Costa Rica or somewhere, and I'm completely lost. And I know the Atlantic Ocean is out there somewhere, but I have no idea where. And I take my machete and just hack, 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 hack. And then after a long time, <laughs> more than a year for each book, boom, there's the Atlantic Ocean. I found it. There it is. And I look behind me, and there's this, you know, this jungle that's been cut, this one person white. And there's a whole line of people saying, Thank you, Philip. We didn't have all year to spend answering this question, but you did. And, and so you've helped show us the way. Wow. And uh, that's, what, that's what gives me most satisfaction, I guess. And, and if I died tonight, then those books would still be out there. You know, the, the legacy of hacking through the jungle. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, I guess that was it. That's and, great. You know, I, I, I feel... It's a memoir where the light fell, tells a story. I think if God, I got the worst of the church and the best of the church. Now this memoir is mostly about the worst of the church, <laughs> yeah. but, but it's as if God looked on me and said, well, Philip, you've seen the worst. I'll show you the best and introduces me to uh, Dr. Paul Brand. I spent 10 years with him. The other people in Soul Survivor, the people who were living that I was able to get to know and model my own life after. I mean, these are princes of people. They're you know, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative in uh, Alabama and, and Gary Haugen of the International Justice Mission and Francis Collins at the National Institutes of Health. You know, these are my new Soul Survivor people. I keep looking for people like that, that I want to learn from and be, and be like, and then uh, write about them. And, and so... The, the the crowning achievement is is not my it's not mine it's God's who who took uh, a pretty tough upbringing and a pretty tough dose of the gos of the gospel that was hard to overcome a toxic dose and and somehow redeemed it and and gave me a, a, a life. 45 years uh, so far, a life of writing where I could actually make a living by trying to sort that through and and come up with some coherence in, in my life. Um, the, I, I've used this phrase just recently, I think about it more and more, that pain redeemed impresses me more than pain removed. Hmm. And and that's true of so many people I've interviewed over the years, Johnny Erickson, Thada, people like that where they want, above anything else, to get rid of this problem. So I, Johnny wants to walk. You know, Johnny yeah. wants to dance. They didn't get that. They didn't get that answer. But pain redeemed. What she has been able to do as a prophet to the church is unbelievable. And I look at my own life, and people read, read where the light fell and say, man, did you get a bad dose? And... You know, when you're a kid, you're not comparing these things. This is just life. So I wasn't that aware of it as a kid. 
But looking back, I say, well, yeah, I guess I did. I, I had a not the most wholesome house <laughs> that I lived in, and certainly not the most wholesome church, but pain redeemed impresses me more than pain removed. Mm -hmm. And and that's God's achievement. That's not my, as I told you, I wasn't even looking for it. That's right. But God chose me, and, and I'm forever grateful. Amen. What a life it has been so far, and what a legacy it will be. Um, and I am as I said, beyond grateful on a personal level. And I know I speak for thousands of others who might be listening to this in the, in the months ahead. I hope that everybody listening or watching will pick up um, your memoir, Where the Light Fell. And uh, in, in addition, while you're there, be sure to pick up Soul Survivor, which I am yeah. so, so thrilled. You've made my day by telling me that's your favorite book you've written as well. You don't know what that did for me when you said <laughs> that. Um, it is a, a great book. Another one that really touched me, I forgot to mention earlier, is The Bible Jesus Read, which was a great mm -hmm. um, treatment of the Old Testament and why it matters today. I'm just, Philip, just so grateful for you and, and uh Myself and our, our team here and all of our listeners will continue to pray for you and Janet as you uh, pursue what God has for you next. Well, thank you much, Derek. We covered a lot of ground and uh, you, you gave me space to talk and had a good conversation. I appreciate it. Well, I enjoyed it. It's uh, been an honor and I'm grateful for you joining us on the Maybe God podcast. So, Philip Yancey, thank you. My pleasure.